Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our, our webinar this morning. Uh, my name is Ian. I'm the head of insights here at QMinds. Uh, and my team and I spend most of our days, probably all of our days, partnering with our clients to help them make the most out of their insights programs. And of course, that means making the most out of the QMind platform um, itself. But what I'd like to talk to you today about is customer driven pricing strategies. Uh, and specifically how market research, how insights can help drive and empower these within organizations. Uh, we're going to talk uh, about four things. First of all, we obviously need to stop and think about, well, what is a customer-driven pricing strategy and make sure we've got a, a common understanding of what that is. We'll then look at four different ways that you can develop, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and drive a customer-driven pricing strategy using market research, using insights. Very importantly, we'll go through some, some watch outs, some pitfalls that we have learned over the years of, of running these programs with our clients. And finally, uh, we'll bring it to life for you with a case study. Uh, one of our clients has kindly allowed us to, to share um, an overview of how they have used market research to put a customer driven pricing strategy into action within their business. Please post questions as we go along. Um, I will try and keep an eye on the, the, the chat function. Uh, maybe for the first time in my life, I'll be able to multitask and answer them as we go. But don't worry, Mark's going to keep an eye on them. He'll come back at the end and he will sort of facilitate and make sure we cover those questions for you. Um, but otherwise, do you put your hand up. Mark can always stop me and, and, and get me to, to clarify something as we go. So what is a customer-driven pricing strategy? Well, the definition goes that it is one where an organization sets its prices based on its customer's perceived value of its product or service or brand. Sounds obvious, sounds simple, but I think you'd be surprised how few organizations actually do this or, or at least do it in its, in its purest form. Perhaps maybe before we, we dive into the detail, we could put this into context by thinking about different pricing strategies uh, maybe if we start by splitting this into two broad groups. So on the one hand, you might have what you would call a product-led pricing strategy. And this is where an organization starts off by thinking about the product it's producing or the service it's delivering, uh, what that is, how it's packaged, branded, marketed, distributed. It'll then consider the costs involved in doing that. And then think about, well, what price can we take that product or service to market given the costs of doing so? And only then will it think about, do the customers value this? And who are we going to target that? A customer-led pricing strategy, on the other hand, flips that on its head. It starts off by thinking, who are our customers or our target customers? What do they need? What do they value? And what, and what value do they hold in the products or service or the brand that we are, we are offering? And then the organization would think about, okay, what costs are involved and what price could be charged relative to what the customer is willing to pay? Uh, and what does that mean in terms of the final product service package that we can actually take to market? So same elements in both. They're just uh, starting from a different point. Now, worth saying that there are many types of pricing strategies. So a customer-driven pricing strategy is often referred to as a value-based pricing strategy. There are other types. They all have their merit in the right situation. We have a cost plus approach where a fixed margin is added to, to costs quite often seen in commodity markets where supply costs uh, are very volatile. We have competitive pricing strategies where brands decide to purposely set a low price to steal share or a high price to build a premium. Um, Tesla are a good example there of building their premium brand, although now happen to get more competitive with the, the Chinese brands coming into market. Uh, price skimming, um, quite often seen in tech markets, launch a new product at a high price uh, to build demand, take advantage of those early adopters, but then drop the price when you want to grow share. Penetration pricing is kind of the opposite. We've seen a lot of that in the subscription TV market. It's very crowded and new brands will launch a very low price in order to gain uh, a customer base and then they'll slowly increase prices. Uh, also dynamic pricing. Uh, now, this is where prices varies based on demand and seasonality. When I wrote this deck, I thought British Airways, Airlines was a great example. I think if I mentioned the words Oasis and Ticketmaster, everyone would uh, know exactly what a dynamic pricing strategy is. These different strategies don't need to be mutually exclusive, and, and usually they're not. 
Uh, brands will use a blend of them or use different ones in a different life cycle uh, or point in the in the product life cycle. And certainly uh, any business needs an element of cost plus in the long term to remain profitable. But we're going to focus on the customer driven or value based pricing strategy today. So, as I said, I'm going to focus on four ways that you could use market research to develop one of these customer driven pricing strategies. Um, and we'll do that. We will look at market research techniques, but I want to frame it in terms of business challenges or business problems. So these are the four that we will talk about. Firstly, an organization might think, well, okay, what is the highest price or what's the optimum price I can charge for an existing product or service? Or an organization might be faced with, well, what price would be acceptable for a new product or service I'm taking to market? Maybe there isn't a direct competitor. We don't have a benchmark to go by. What's going to be acceptable? Am I going to be able to do this in, in a profitable uh, and long-term way? Thirdly, uh, it might be thinking about what's the price premium for my brand or product? What could I charge uh, because of the investment I've made in my brand and my marketing, my advertising? And finally, uh, some brands are looking at price strategies within a wider marketing mix. And then price can't be treated in isolation. And that's where we might look at what's the optimum package, if you like, of the product I offer, brand I uh, I deliver, the price and the elements and the service that, that I deliver within that. So we'll look at each of these in turn. Okay, so first of all, we have, what is the highest price I could charge for existing products? So this is where we would use a technique which is quite often referred to as a Gabba Granger. It's actually very, very simple. Um, for well-established products and services, this is a nice way to find out whether a plan price increase or price drop is going to affect uh, market share or custom uptake uh, significantly at these given price points. Basically, it's a likelihood to buy question. So you can see in the example here, um, how likely would you be to buy this product at a given price? And we have a five point scale, very likely due to very unlikely. If the customer says they are very likely or quite likely, they would then see a price increase. If they still say very likely or quite likely, they'll see another price increase. And we keep going until uh, each customer opts out of, of, of purchasing. Um, over our sample, uh, with everyone doing this, what we're able to come up with is a very simple elasticity curve. So a graph that shows us uh, how willingness to pay or likelihood to buy drops as price increases. And the key thing we're looking at here uh, is the tipping point or the point with which Willingness to pay likely to buy drops significantly, i.e. going beyond this point, you are going to uh, um, see a big drop off in, in, in sales potentially. If combined with a market sizing study or a market sizing element to your market research study, you can very easily take the next step here and create volume forecasts and revenue forecasts, which can be really powerful for, for, for teams within brands to, to, to do the, the uh, pricing strategy and planning. As I said, often used when we're looking at range reviews, uh, new variant, uh, new products, um, or there is a new new competitor you enter in the market and the price has been disrupted. Second challenge is what about new products or services? What would an acceptable price range be? How do we do that first step in customer value to drive a customer driven pricing strategy in this scenario? Okay. Bit of a mouthful, but the technique we would use here would be quite often called a price sensitivity measure or a PSM, sometimes called a Van Westendorp. Um, the name may be complicated. The technique is actually very simple. This time we ask four questions. We haven't got our given set price range that we're testing. And we would ask each consumer at what price point, in this case, at, at what price would you consider an Apple iPhone 15 Pro Max to be Firstly, so low that you would question the quality, so too cheap, uh, a bargain and, a, and great value for money, um, starting to get so expensive that you would have to think about before buying it, so it's expensive, or so expensive you would not consider buying it, so too expensive. And we allow uh, the respondents here to, to enter their prices for free form. What do we get from this? Well, we get four demand or elasticity curves this time. So you can see on this chart we have uh, the results of how many people thought the different price points were too cheap, too expensive, a bargain, and expensive. Um, what this gives us is firstly this range of acceptable prices. 
So you can see between what we call here the, the point of marginal cheapness, which is where, as many people think, it's too expensive, it's too cheap, up to the point of marginal expensiveness, which is where, as many people think, it's a bargain, it's really expensive. This tells us that within this, there's an acceptable price range. If you go lower, too many people think it's too cheap, so you're undervaluing it. And if you go beyond this, too many people think it's too expensive, um, so you're going to lose out on too much market share. Um, personally, I think the range is the best take out of this, which then goes forward into the next stages of the pricing strategy. So there you can think about um, cost and product and what price within this you can offer. There is a third point there, the optimal price point, which is where many people think it's a bargain, it's too cheap. You can take that as a good indicator of what that optimum price point in terms of uh, potential uptake might be. When is this used? Uh, I said new product launches um, equally, if there's a new variant, if it's a very different uh, product or element coming into market where you're not sure where you want to start with your price point. Okay, third challenge. Uh, what if I want to know what, not just what the price is, but what's the price premium I can charge because of my brand or my product? And this is where we use something called a, a brand price trade-off or, or a BPTO, it's sometimes referred to. Um, and this gives us that more intangible value, this sort of plus element on our cost that our, our brand is worth versus our competitors. So you can see here, I've used a cola example. Um, it's a pretty generic product. Some people might argue, but they kind of all taste the same. Same flavor, same product, same volume, same packaging. What difference is the brand uh, ultimately? Um, so in this scenario, we would show the respondent here. You can see five different colas. Uh, they're all the same uh, product variant and size. What difference is the price? And we would ask them, which of these would you choose or none of these? And if they chose, let's say, Karma Cola, they would then see the same five again, but the Karma Cola price would be increased, a bit like the Gabba Granger example we saw earlier. And again, you would keep going until they, they opt out of that brand. Very simple for the respondent. It's a little bit more complicated than setup and analysis. Um, but ultimately, this gives us, again, some price elasticities for each brand. But I think uh, very valuable here, it gives us a difference in share at a given price. Um, so at a set price, how much am I more likely uh, to get an uptake of my product versus my competitors? Or... Um, at a given market share, how much more can I charge versus my competitors? So it allows us within this pricing strategy to kind of know, looking at the current market, what premium could I charge without losing too much market share? Um, as I said, this is one where in legacy markets uh, and maybe where there's new brands coming in, disrupting it, and you want to know what you can, you can charge because you're a longstanding brand and you've really invested in your product. Finally then, uh, what is my optimum price if I have to take into account other things like brand and product to pack? Um, this is where we would use a trade-off exercise known as a conjoint. Um, so if what we do is we break uh, the market down into first of all variables. So you can see in this example, we're looking at meal deals in the supermarket. We've got the brand of supermarket you might buy it from. You would have your main meal, your, what sandwich you're gonna have, your side meal. Uh, your drink and also your price uh, and a bit like the uh, brand price trade-off we would ask the respondent which of these would you buy uh, or would you buy none of these and uh, they would see a series of maybe 10 12 hopefully not more than that uh, combinations and what we're looking for is firstly which element is driving their choice are they more influenced by price are they more influenced by brand or main main meal um, and then also within that what are the tipping points of, of each of those? What are their preferences within, uh, within each of the variables, particularly here looking, looking at price? A um, bit like BPTO, it's quite simple for the respondent. This one is actually quite complicated in terms of design the task. You can imagine, depending on how many variables and levels you've got, you could have hundreds of different tasks that you need to test. Uh, so you would also need quite a large sample for this. Uh, but in that design, you're able to make sure every possible combination is tested. And it gives us a number of nice, simple outputs. Firstly, a level of what I would call uh, importance. So uh, how important is each variable in driving choice? So in this example, the cost or price of my meal deal accounts for 35% of uh, customer's choice. So it's a very price-driven market. That's good. And then within each of those variables, we would get... Uh, 
sort of the elasticity or the utility levels of each. So in this example, you've got your price elasticity curve. You might see the value of the brand or the value of uh, particular sandwich options. And this helps us to decide how important is price and how much weight should we put in our marketing mix? And also what might that optimum price be? The real power though comes from building a simulator. So probably not gonna be able to see the details on this screen, but it gives us this wonderful tool where teams within an organization can set different competitive scenarios for their product and competitive products, different prices, different product combinations, and simulate what's gonna to happen to likelihood to buy, which is not direct, but it's a proxy for market share. And by dropping price or increasing price, uh, what influence could that have on, on uptake? And as I said, conjoint is not price alone. So that can be done in conjunction with other elements within the marketing mix. So really useful if actually a brand's doing a wider market mix review. Whichever one of these techniques you're using, uh, there are some key watch outs uh, that we would ask you to think about. Firstly, uh, sampling, ever an issue in market research. But given that we are getting customers to input to a pricing strategy, we need to make sure that the right customers are included. So yes, you want existing customers, but also making sure credible prospects are in there. I would always recommend that you sample based on non-rejectors within your category. And then once you've got your outputs, you can filter your analysis by existing customers, loyal customers, high value customers, et cetera. Secondly is the stimuli. You'll notice they're quite visual techniques and quite often we show the product, making sure you've used realistic, high quality images. And if you're doing competitive testing, like in the BPTO, the brand price trade-off, sorry, and the conjoint, use consistent quality and style of, of images. Thirdly, recognizing this is a very controlled context. These are experiments basically, and we can control all uh, non-price variables, but we can only report and analyze and model what we put in. So when we sit down with stakeholders, it's being really clear about what are the possible parameters that they want to test? What are the full range of prices? What are the competitive mix? What are the elements if we're looking at a conjoint? If I had a pound for every time someone asked me to model and simulate something that wasn't put into the design, I'd be a very rich man. Finally, um, analysis limitations. And really here I'm talking about timing. So yes, it's an experiment. Yes, we can control everything. But the customers we're talking to are responding based on what they know now, what's going on in the market. And that might be discounting that's going on, special offers. It could be wider macroeconomic issues. I would always say put a use by date on the output and reporting of these so that people know that just because the analysis and the insights now in three, six, 12 months, they may not be if something significantly has changed within your market. Okay, just to wrap up before we start to, to look at questions, um, just wanted to share a case study. Our, our friends at uh, Jordan's Dorset Rivita uh, very kindly allowed us to share a case study with you. We've done a number of studies with them over the last year or so, uh, looking at the potential impact of changes to their price or their pack in various uh, serial categories that they have brands in. And this is because it's a time when all suppliers are being challenged with rising cost of production. It's a bit of a backlash from customers around shrinkflation. Uh, and they wanted to make sure that they got customer input before they made any important and costly decisions um, on their price and pack uh, strategy. So we worked with them uh, very closely partners to create uh, a number of studies and we used a conjoint approach where we looked at brand and product and pack size and price understanding what is the relative importance of pack size and price relative to the product and the brand that delivers it what is the value held by each brand and product uh, in these categories that maybe they can use to withstand any volatility uh, in the market and most importantly what are those relative elasticities of price and pack and how do they interact? So how would consumers react if a, uh, a particular cereal had a price increase or had a pack decrease or a combination of the two? Um, the insights used by Jordans uh, were used to make crucial decisions about this, both decisions they took as a result of the insights, but also decisions that they backed away from because of the insights. And I think that's a great example of, of a brand putting the customer first uh, in their pricing strategy and their decision-making and being bold and brave enough to, 
to go with the hypothesis and back away from it based on the customer feedback. Um, and that, I think, wraps up our webinar, hopefully. Uh, Great. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Um, my, my timer is saying I nailed 20 minutes. I'm quite pleased yeah, with that. Well done. Very good. Um, if there are any questions, do please um, post in chat or just let me know. But whilst that's happening, I've, I've got a couple for you. Just just sort of following up, what, what what's the sort of variance in, in cost and time of each of each of these in terms of cost of running them, time to deliver? And, and which one would you say, which ones or one is the most frequently used by clients? That's a good question. I mean, the Gabba Granger is probably the most used and, and the cheapest and quickest because it's effectively one question. So it's very easy to include in an, in an existing study, in a wider study. Um, secondly, I would probably say that the, the price sensitivity measure is a little bit more complicated um, and it's four questions versus one. But again, if you've got a wider uh, customer study, you could put this pricing element within there. Um, and the analysis is it's, it's more complicated than again Gabba Granger, uh, but um, but but still relatively cheap. The other two because they involve task design and modelling, they do take a little bit longer in, in the setup. Um, you know you, you need a little bit more time to set up design those tasks. You need a little bit more time to analyse the results afterwards, um, and that does obviously add a cost element to that. But the Gabba Granger and the price sensitivity measure much more frequently and widely used. For that reason, they're very versatile, they're very simple, and you can add them in. And one final one. Do you, do you think clients find, find these easy to understand and integrate in the businesses? Obviously, you talked about Jordan's, but just generally speaking across clients. Yeah, I don't. I think as an industry, we don't help ourselves. I mean, look at the names, Gabba Granger, Van Westendorp, you know, BPTO. We, we, we overcomplicate it, and, and actually, the outputs are very simple. But I think that's really important that uh, we work with uh, our client side partners to make sure that the results that we produce are meaningful uh, uh, and, and can be understood. I think Conjoint particularly, the outputs are really powerful, but Conjoint can be very confusing. What we tend to do is work with uh, the client side insights team and we would use the simulator to run scenarios and then we present those scenarios because they tell stories. They're like, okay, this is the current market situation. If you did X, then Y might happen. If your competitor did X, then Y might happen. And that brings it to life. And then once you've got them to understand the power of it, then you can sort of maybe give them the simulator to play with. Yes, that, that's always the challenge, isn't it? The blend of sort of consultants and support and allowing clients to, you know, take it themselves and implement yeah. it within the business yeah and i mentioned when we did when i talked about the um you know the, the gabba granger if you've got a market sizing element then you can create your outputs in the form of um sales and revenue and that is just such so much more powerful than the organization if you talk, talk about x thousand sales and y thousand or y million pounds worth of revenue and changes in sales and revenue they understand that and that means something in terms of their internal business planning and again this is all you know our webinar today was about customer driven pricing strategy so that's what we're trying to do we're putting the customer at the heart of that but it's not but recognizing that's not the end of the story for organizations it's the start brilliant well i think we are just a couple of minutes early which is always a winner um conscious of people's time um i think that that's 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 it for now thanks very much Ian. Well, and thank yeah, you very much for everyone absolute pleasure thank you all for joining us this morning and enjoy the rest of the day everyone thank you so much and we'll be circulating uh the report up after the uh, webinar as well so thanks for everyone's time thank you Ian. bye now